Hi, I'm Professor Joanne Lind, and in today's uh, video, we're going to look at how we metabolise fat. So the learning outcome for today is to explain the processes involved in fat and lipid metabolism in a healthy individual. As you may have seen in my previous videos, we have already covered carbohydrate metabolism. So we've looked at how carbohydrates are metabolised to glucose 6-phosphate, down to pyruvate and down to acetyl-CoA, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Today we're going to switch to the red portion of this and we're going to cover fat and lipid metabolism via beta oxidation and we're going to look at ketogenesis and how they produce ketone bodies. So this slide here picks up digestion and picks up where we've got the triacylglycerides being digested through the intestinal system and then how they're absorbed into the stomach. So as shown in my micronutrients video, the triacylglycerides first of all have the bile salts and the lipases break two of the fatty acid chains off that triglyceride and the fatty acid chains are then taken up um, across the intestinal membrane and the monoacylglyceride is also taken up. So they're absorbed through that system. And once they've done that, we're now going to look today at how they are metabolized, so how we break those down to either produce energy or store energy for later use. So here you can see that um, once they're absorbed, we actually reassemble those monoacylglyceride glyceride with the two fatty acids back to a triacylglyceride or a triglyceride they're the same thing so this is an overview of fat metabolism so let's go into a little bit more detail to see how we break down those triacylglycerides into the fatty acids and monoacylglycerides and then we'll step through this process where you can see how we get from ingestion of fats to storage of fats so we've done one, we've ingested our fats. Number two is the addition of bile salts and lipases to degrade the triacylglycerides. So if we have a look at that, there's different ways that this can occur, but the lipases break off the fatty acid chains. So they can um, break, strip off one or two at a time, but basically you're stripping these fatty acids so that the fatty acids in themselves can pass across the um, intestinal mucosa so that they can get into the bloodstream. So that's what's happening at number two there. At number three, we need to look at how the fatty acids are taken up by the intestinal mucosa and then converted back to triacylglycerols. So if we have a look how that happens, we had those two fatty acids plus the monoacylglyceride past the intestinal mucosa, pass through the intestinal mucosa and once it's done that, we need to reassemble it and then we package it in what's called a chylomicron, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Now, it's important because we need a way that these fatty acids can actually travel through our body and in our bloodstream, but our blood is watery and fats are fatty and fats and water don't like each other very much, so we need a way that they can move through our system. So we're now up to number four, which is forming these chylomicrons, which is the largest um, packaged fat like we showed in the um, macronutrients short video when we were looking at um, lipid proteins. The chylomicrons is the largest of those. So this is where once you've um, eaten some fats and you've transported across your intestinal mucosa, you're now forming these chylomicrons. So there's an image of them on these slides here where they um, have apolipoproteins on their outer surface and they've got major components in their membrane. So they've got phospholipids. Inside they've got the triacylglycerols and they've got cholesterol esters. And there's cholesterol also embedded within the membrane of the chylomicron to give it that fluidity. And when I say membrane, I'm talking about the lipid bilayer, not like a cell membrane, but this is a lipid bilayer. 
Now, as these chylomicrons move through our system, they react with an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. And that enzyme actually releases some of the fatty acids from the chylomicron into that place where that reaction is occurring. It also has the glycerol, which is a, the top part of the triacylglyceride, which is also being released at that point. And that's important because some um, tissues and organs rely on the breakdown of fats for energy. For example, our heart has a preference for fatty acid breakdown to produce energy rather than glucose, which is different to somewhere like the brain, which has a preference for glucose as its major metabolic fuel. So we've made these chylomicrons, we've started transporting them through our system, and we've got these enzymes that help unpack the chylomicrons to deliver some of the fatty acids and glycerol to places that need it to um, produce energy. So that was four, five, and six. So now we're at the, the point where you could have fatty acids entering a cell. And at that point, it is either that we're going to break those fatty acids down in a process called beta oxidation, which we'll look at shortly, or we store those um, fatty acids by repackaging them back into um, triacylglycerides. And we'll get to beta oxidation, but for this purpose, I wanted to show you how we store fat. So we store fat in adipose tissues, and you can see the orange sections of this image on the right, that's fat molecules. And um, we store them if we don't need them. So it is a highly concentrated form of energy that we put away in our body for later energy use. And if you think back to the macronutrients video where we talked about the energy equation and energy in equals energy out equals no change in energy stores. Well, if you're eating more than you're exercising, then you will have an imbalance and therefore you will be storing fats in that scenario. So a very general summary of what we've just said is you take food in in the form of triacylglycerides. We then break that down into fatty acids and a monoacylglyceride in order to cross the intestinal mucosa. We then repackage that back into triacylglycerides and put that into a chylomicrons to enable it to move through the bloodstream. And then as the chylomicrons move around, the, um, the lipase helps break that down again and deliver the energy to cells. And if you don't need the energy immediately, then the remaining will actually be reassembled into triacylglycerides and stored in adipose tissue throughout the body. So that's the storage aspect. Now let's look at fatty acids as a fuel, as a source of energy. And there's three steps, three major steps to using fatty acids of fuel, as fuel. First, we need to mobilize it. So we need to get it out of our fat stores. If we're not talking about the ones that we eat and use up immediately, let's talk about the ones that we've got stored. We're gonna um, get rid of some of our fats. So we need to mobilize that out of storage and then we need to transport it into the mitochondrial matrix. And in the mitochondrial matrix is where we would break the fatty acids down and then we can process it through the Krebs cycle, which was depicted in a previous video. So let's have a look at these three major stages. So step one, as I mentioned, was mobilization. So the first thing that we need to do is hydrolysis of the triacylglycerols by lipases. So we need to break them down into the glycerol component and into the fatty acid chains. Now these lipases are activated by different things. So hormones could activate the lipases. So you might have epinephrine or norepinephrine, or if you're an American audience, that's adrenaline and noradrenaline. Now those would say, okay, we need some energy now, let's start mobilizing our fat storage. Glucagon is another hormone that might um, mobilize your fat stores. So glucagon is a signal of a low fed state. So that's when you don't have very high blood sugar. Your pancreas puts out glucagon. So you that would be saying, let's switch to our energy stores because I don't have enough in my blood from my diet at this stage. 
and there's other hormones that might activate this process. So the process is that we're going to break the triacylglycerols down by lipases and the signal for that is hormones. Now this is prevented by insulin. So if you have high levels of insulin in your blood, then it prevents this breakdown. And that makes sense because insulin is a hormone that is generally produced in a well-fed state. So for someone who's metabolically normal, their pancreas detects the blood sugar levels and it puts out insulin when it knows that the blood glucose level is high. So you don't want to be accessing your fat stores if you've already got a lot of glucose in your bloodstream. You only want to access your fat stores if you need the fat to create energy. Now, the glycerol portion of this breakdown of this mobilization is actually absorbed back into the liver and we phosphorylate it and then we oxidize it to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, I'll come back to that in a later video about the integration of these pathways, but you'll see that that glycerol portion is actually important in creating more glucose via gluconeogenesis. But for the purpose of this video, we're talking about how do we access energy from fats. And initially, what we've done is we've um, activated it and we're going to put free fatty acids back out there in our system so that we can deliver that to places to undergo metabolism. Now, just to quickly show you an image, and we haven't done gluconeogenesis yet, but this is where the glycerol portion of the fatty acid breakdown could enter either gluconeogenesis or it could also add to glycolysis, depending on the state of the body at the time. So all these pathways become integrated with each other. So now back to fatty acid, and now we need to get it into the mitochondrial matrix. So how do we transport fatty acids into the mitochondrial matrix? Now we do this by a big protein called acylcarnitine translocase. Now we have um, something called carnitine. Now I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, bodybuilders, if anyone's into heavy weight training and supplements, they may have heard of carnitine because carnitine is required to actually help transport these acyl-CoA molecules, which is what we've, we've got from this fatty acid breakdown into the mitochondrial matrix. So what we actually do is we take the L-carnitine and we take our fatty acid chain, which I'm calling acyl-CoA, and we actually combine those two together to form something called O-acyl-carnitine. And it's in that format that it can actually be transported across the intermembrane of the mitochondria into the mitochondrial matrix through the acyl-carnitine translocase. So we transport that through, and then once you're there, the enzyme carnitine acyl transferase 2 actually breaks it back down into the two components that you started with, acyl-CoA, which is your fatty acid chain, and L-carnitine. So now we've transported it into the mitochondrial matrix. Now we need to use it for energy. So let's have a look at how we do that. This process is called beta oxidation. So the metabolic process that breaks down fatty acids is called beta oxidation. Now that's stage one shown here on this diagram. And the ultimate aim of beta oxidation is to take two carbons at a time off your fatty acid chain and that produces acetyl-CoA, which if you go back and look at the Krebs cycle video, acetyl-CoA is the molecule that we need to enter the Krebs cycle. So let's have a look at how we actually get the two carbon molecules off a fatty acid chain. So this is beta oxidation, so fatty acid oxidation. Now, I don't expect you to remember the names of all these molecules, but I'm demonstrating this so you can see how two molecules at a time get taken off to produce acetyl-CoA. So we start with the acetyl-CoA, in this case, there's, it's a carbon-16 molecule, so we've got 16 carbons in our fatty acid chain. And that reacts with um, FAD+, and an enzyme, and the byproduct of that is FADH2, and we already know that's a high energy molecule, and that um, converts the acyl-CoA into a trans-enol-CoA. 
So once we have done that, we need to um, add some water. So we've produced one bit of energy already. We are then um, have made a double bond in that acyl-CoA and that's important because now we're going to combine that double bond with um, water. So if we have a look, there's two hydrogens and an oxygen and we split that and spread that out across the next molecule and that makes um, hydroxyl acyl-CoA which is further broken down to produce more energy in the form of NADH. And we've also had um, a hydrogen ion being removed. The next step of the reaction, we've now got a keto acyl CoA. So there's your hydrogen ion. We've now got a keto acyl CoA where we've got a carbon with a double bonded oxygen to it. Now we combine that with coash and if we put those two together, you can actually see that one byproduct is acetyl CoA, and where that acetyl CoA was sitting in that keto acyl CoA, you now have the um, coenzyme A at the end attached to your fatty acid, and your fatty acid chain is now shortened by two carbons. So that will then go through the process again. And again, you went from 16 carbons, we went through that once, you've got 14 carbons, go through it again and you'll have 12 carbons. So each time, importantly, you're producing acetyl-CoA. And you go back to the start with two less carbons each time. And at the end, you're always adding to the end, the um, coash combines to put the CoA on the end of your fatty acid chain. And that just happens over and over again until all you've got left is acetyl-CoA. So for a 16 carbon molecule, you will make eight acetyl-CoAs. And in the process of making those acetyl-CoAs, you will make one FADH2 and one NADH for every acetyl-CoA that you produce. So a summary of this um, short video is that for every acetyl-CoA created, you create one NADH and one FADH2. Now, if you think and revise the Krebs cycle, once acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, you will produce three NADH and one FADH2 plus one GTP, which is equivalent to an ATP in the Krebs cycle. So therefore, for every two carbons oxidized from a fatty acid, you get the equivalent of four NADH, two FADH2, and one ATP. Now, that is a lot of energy. So you get roughly 16 ATP per two carbons oxidized, which is why one gram of fat in your diet is a lot more energy rich than one gram of glucose. So if you think one gram of one glucose molecule will only produce two acetyl-CoA, where a 16 carbon fatty acid chain will produce acetyl -CO, eight acetyl-CoAs plus extra energy. But what happens if we're not in an aerobic state or we're not in a well-fed state and so that oxaloacetate in the Krebs cycle in the liver is not available in the liver to undergo the Krebs cycle. We need an alternate way to still use these fatty acid chains without going through the Krebs cycle in the liver. So let's have a look at that. So it's important to remember that in most tissues the acetyl-CoA will enter the Krebs cycle and produce ATP. But the liver is different. In the liver, it's the metabolic, metabolic powerhouse of our body and it is where it has to balance whether you're in a well-fed state or you're in an underfed state. So high glucose blood levels or low blood glucose levels. So when fat breakdown dominates, so this is when you don't have a lot of glucose present, in the liver, the oxaloacetate within the Krebs cycle is shunted away to make glucose via gluconeogenesis, which I'll show you in detail in an integration video that I'm going to do.
So if oxaloacetate is not available in the liver, acetyl-CoA needs to be diverted to a different process which is called ketogenesis. And this process occurs in the liver and it makes ketone bodies which are then transported into other places in the body and they're soluble and once they're in other places they can then be used in the Krebs cycle to produce energy. So let's have a look at ketogenesis. So on our map we're looking at now acetyl-CoA not going down into the Krebs cycle but rather going off to the side into ketogenesis and ketone bodies. So ketogenesis is a process by which two acetyl-CoA molecules are combined to produce acetoacetyl-CoA. Another reaction then occurs and stepwise, you don't need to memorize all the different names in the intermediate steps, but it's important that you know that you then get acetoacetate and D3-hydroxybutyrate, which are your ketone bodies. You also get a byproduct, which is acetone. Now, the importance of these ketone bodies are that they can be transported easily through the bloodstream because they're not fatty, they're water soluble. Um, and they can be transported to places to be used as energy source by converting them back up from the bottom of this diagram back up into acetyl-CoA. So these are reversible reactions. Now, in the liver, you might not be able to undergo the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle because oxaloacetate is being used to produce glucose. But in other places in the body, you still do have oxaloacetate. So once it reaches its destination, other than the liver, it can undergo the Krebs cycle. Now, anyone who's been on a, a Atkins diet or a, a no or low carb diet would have their bodies going into this ketogenic state and relying on the breakdown of fats to produce energy. Now, one of the byproducts of that type of dieting is bad breath. And the bad breath in those individuals is actually a result of the acetone. So we have the three products here, one of which is that smelly acetone. Similarly, if you have someone with type 1 diabetes who has um, gone into a ketogenic state, which is not good for someone with type 1 diabetes because their blood sugar levels might be really high, um, but their body doesn't know they're high because they're not responding, they're not producing insulin, so they're not knowing to take the glucose up so they think they're in a starved state in which case they start breaking down their fats and in doing that they're producing lots of ketone bodies so they will also get a sickly sweet type of breath smell which is an indicator that they're also in ketogenesis there's more technical ways to measure it though from a finger prick of the blood so that's how we produce ketone bodies so how do we use it as fuel? As mentioned, um, the acetoacetate um, would then be converted back to two acetyl-CoA molecules and um, it's, it's transported to other tissues that's important for this step. So you move from the mitochondria in the liver into the blood and then it's transported to those peripheral tissues and as already mentioned, the heart muscle actually prefers fatty acid breakdown. So it prefers to undergo beta oxidation for its energy rather than um, glycolysis and glucose metabolism. So heart muscle and the renal cortex, they actually use acetoacetate in preference to glucose. So we know that some those organs prefer fatty acids in the form of acetoacetate as ketone bodies. Well, places like the brain and the red blood cells, which I didn't mention before, but the red blood cells particularly prefer, they need glucose in order to function. So in a well-nourished person with a balanced diet, your brain would rely on glucose and we need glucose for our red blood cells. The brain can adapt over time, however, to utilizing acetoacetate. So this is when it's in a starved state or in cases of type 1 diabetes or individuals who might be on a very low carbohydrate diet. So ketone bodies are important in all these instances and the brain actually starts switching. But one of the side effects of those diets is often headaches and headaches is coming from the fact that the 
brain isn't getting the glucose as its energy source, but rather acetoacetate. So if you just pause on this slide and look at a summary of what we know, you've got the liver in the center there as the powerhouse and where everything goes. So your glucose is going to your brain, your um, triacylglycerides is being transported around and it can provide energy source for your muscle and for your heart. Um, we know the glycerol portion of fats is often used in the liver to help create glucose. So you can just follow this diagram around and see where the different portions of carbohydrates and fats are utilized. So the final summary of this lecture, we know that fat is the richest form of energy. So it's nine kilocalories per gram um, of um, food, fat intake. We know that it's longer to digest than carbohydrates and proteins. So it's the last to be digested. So it's good to in include fats in a balanced diet so you stay uh, feeling fuller for longer. We know the glycerol portion of the triacylglycerides can be used to produce glucose and we'll go into that in more detail in another video. And if we are using the, the fatty acids as energy, we break them down via beta oxidation to acetyl-CoA. And that acetyl-CoA can either enter the Krebs cycle or you can transport it to other tissues as ketone bodies. Again, here's my contact details. And if you want to go over beta oxidation, there's a good animation in this link here in chapter 19. Thank you.